Good evening. Welcome to tonight's reading from A Princess of Mars, previously titled Under the Moons of Mars, the first book of the Chronicles of Barsoom by Edgar Rice Burroughs. I'm Finn J.D. John, and I will be your reader tonight. Chapter 25 The Looting of Zodanga As the great gate where I stood swung open, my fifty Tharks, headed by Tars Tarkas himself, rode in upon their mighty thoats. I led them to the palace walls, which I negotiated easily without assistance. Once inside, however, the gate gave me considerable trouble but I finally was rewarded by seeing it swing upon its huge hinges, and soon my fierce escort was riding across the gardens of the Jeddak of Zodanga. As we approached the palace, I could see through the great windows of the first floor into the brilliantly illuminated audience chamber of Thon Kosas. The immense hall was crowded with nobles and their women, as though some important function was in process. There was not a guard in sight without the palace, due, I presume, to the fact that the city and palace walls were considered impregnable, and so I came close and peered within. At one end of the chamber, upon massive golden thrones encrusted with diamonds, sat Than Kosas and his consort, surrounded by officers and dignitaries of state. Before them stretched a broad aisle, lined on either side with soldiery, and as I looked there entered this aisle at the far end of the hall the head of a procession which advanced to the foot of the throne. First there marched four officers of the Jeddak's guard, bearing a huge salver on which reposed upon a cushion of scarlet silk a great golden chain with a collar and padlock at each end. Directly behind these officers came four others, carrying a similar salver, which supported the magnificent ornaments of a prince and princess of the reigning house of Zodanga. At the foot of the throne these two parties separated and halted, facing each other at opposite sides of the aisle. Then came more dignitaries, and the officers of the palace and of the army, and finally two figures entirely muffled in scarlet silk so that not a feature of either was discernible. These two stopped at the foot of the throne, facing Thon Kosas. When the balance of the procession had entered and assumed their stations, Thon Kosas addressed the couple standing before him. I could not hear his words, but presently two officers advanced and removed the scarlet robe from one of the figures, and I saw that Kantos Khan had failed in his mission, for it was Sab Thon, Prince of Zodanga, who stood revealed before me. Thon Kosas now took a set of the ornaments from one of the salvers and placed one of the collars of gold upon his son's neck, springing the padlock fast. After a few more words addressed to Saab Thon, he turned to the other figure, from which the officers now removed the enshrouding silks, disclosing to my now comprehending view Deja Thoris, Princess of Helium. The object of the ceremony was clear to me. In another moment, Deja Thoris would be joined forever to the Prince of Zodanga. It was an impressive and beautiful ceremony, I presume, but to me it seemed the most fiendish sight I had ever witnessed, and as the ornaments were adjusted upon her beautiful figure and her collar of gold swung open in the hands of Thon Kosas, I raised my longsword above my head, and with the heavy hilt I shattered the glass of the great window, and sprang into the midst of the astonished assemblage. With a bound I was on the steps of the platform beside Thon Kosas, and as he stood riveted with surprise I brought my longsword down upon the golden chain that would have bound Deja Thoris to another. In an instant all was confusion. A thousand drawn swords menaced me from every quarter, and Saab Thon sprang upon me with a jeweled dagger he had drawn from his nuptial ornaments. I could have killed him as easily as I might have a fly, but the age-old custom of Barsoom stayed my hand, and grasping his wrist as the dagger flew toward my heart, I held him as though in a vice with my long sword pointed to the far end of the hall. Zodanga has fallen, I cried. Look! All eyes turned in the direction I had indicated, and there, forging through the portals of the entranceway, rode Tars Tarkas and his fifty warriors on their great thoats. A cry of alarm and amazement broke from the assemblage, but no word of fear, and in a moment the soldiers and nobles of Zodanga were hurling themselves upon the advancing Tharks. Thrusting Saab Thon headlong from the platform, I drew Deja Thoris to my side. Beside the throne was a narrow doorway, and in this Thon Kosas stood now facing me with drawn longsword. In an instant we were engaged, and I found no mean antagonist. 
As we circled upon the broad platform, I saw Saab Thon rushing up the steps to aid his father, but as he raised his hand to strike, Dejah Thoris sprang before him, and then my sword found the spot that made Saab Thon Jeddak of Zodanga. As his father rolled dead upon the floor, the new Jeddak tore himself free from Dejah Thoris's grasp, and again we faced each other. He was soon joined by a quartet of officers, and with my back against a golden throne I fought once again for Dejah Thoris. I was hard-pressed to defend myself, and yet not strike down Saab Thon, and with him my last chance to win the woman I loved. My blade was swinging with the rapidity of lightning as I sought to parry the thrusts and cuts of my opponents. Two I had disarmed, and one was down, when several more rushed to the aid of their new ruler and to avenge the death of the old. As they advanced, there were cries of, The woman! The woman! Strike her down! It is her plot! Kill her! Kill her! Calling to Dejah Thoris to get behind me, I worked my way up toward the little doorway at the back of the throne, but the officers realized my intentions and three of them sprang in behind me and blocked my chances for gaining a position where I could have defended Dejah Thoris against any army of swordsmen. The Tharks were having their hands full in the center of the room, and I began to realize that nothing short of a miracle could save Dejah Thoris and myself when I saw Tars Tarkas surging through the crowd of pygmies that surrounded him. With one swing of his mighty longsword he laid a dozen corpses at his feet, and so he hewed a pathway before him, until in another moment he stood upon the platform beside me, dealing death and destruction right and left. The bravery of the Zodangans was awe-inspiring. Not one attempted to escape, and when the fighting ceased it was because only Tharks remained alive in the Great Hall, other than Dejah Thoris and myself. Saab Thon lay dead beside his father, and the corpses of the flower of Zodangan nobility and chivalry covered the floor of the bloody shambles. My first thought, when the battle was over, was for Kantos Khan, and leaving Dejah Thoris in charge of Tars Tarkas, I took a dozen warriors and hastened to the dungeons below the palace. The jailers had all left to join the fighters in the throne room, so we searched the labyrinthine prison without opposition. I called Kantos Khan's name aloud in each new corridor and compartment, and finally I was rewarded by hearing a faint response. Guided by the sound, we soon found him helpless in a dark recess. He was overjoyed at seeing me, and to know the meaning of the fight, faint echoes of which had reached his prison cell. He told me that the air patrol had captured him before he reached the high tower of the palace, and that he had not even seen Saab Thon. We discovered that it would be futile to attempt to cut away the bars and chains which held him prisoner, so at his suggestion I returned to the search for bodies on the floor above for keys to open the padlocks of his cell and his chains. Fortunately, among the first I examined, I found his jailer, and soon we had Kantos Khan with us in the throne room. The sounds of heavy firing mingled with shouts and cries came to us from the city's streets, and Tars Tarkas hastened away to direct the fighting without. Kantos Khan accompanied him to act as a guide, the green warriors commencing a thorough search of the palace for other Zodangans and for loot, and Dejah Thoris and I were left alone. She had sunk into one of the golden thrones, and as I turned to her she greeted me with a wan smile. Was there ever such a man? she exclaimed. I know that Barsoom has never before seen your like. Can it be that all earth men are as you? Alone, a stranger, hunted, threatened, persecuted, you have done in a few short months what all the past ages of Barsoom no man has ever done, joined together the wild hordes of the sea bottoms and brought them to fight as allies of a red Martian people. The answer is easy, Dejah Thoris, I replied, smiling. It was not I who did it, it was love. Love for Dejah Thoris, a power that would work greater miracles than this you have seen. A pretty flush overspread her face as she answered. You may say that now, John Carter, and I may listen, for I am free. And more still I have to say to you ere it is again too late, I replied. I have done many strange things in my life, many things that wiser men would not have dared, but never in my wildest fancies have I dreamed of winning a Dejah Thoris for myself, for never had I dreamed that in all the universe dwelled such a woman as the Princess of Helium. That you are a princess does not abash me, but that you are you is enough to make me doubt my sanity as I ask you, my princess, to be mine. He does not need to be abashed who so well knew the answer to his plea before the plea were made, she replied, rising and placing her dear arms on my shoulders, and so I took her in my arms and kissed her. 
and thus in the midst of a city of wild conflict, filled with the alarms of war, with death and destruction reaping their terrible harvests around her, did Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium, true daughter of Mars, the god of war, promise herself in marriage to John Carter, gentleman of Virginia. That's the end of today's reading. We'll continue tomorrow with the next chapter of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Brought to you through the good offices of my institution, the Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds. Text copyright 1912 by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This reading copyright 2014 by Finn J.D. John. More information about this project is at von-junst.org, v-o-n-j-u-n-z-t dot org. Good night, and I wish you interest.